want to introduce you to a board member, Dr. Jane Boyd, who we met at a symposium and who is also a patient. And she's going to give you a little background on where we are with some of the research that you have all graciously funded. So thank you, Jane. Hi. Welcome, everyone. We're glad you're here. Um, how do we get money for research in blepharospasm? I'm going to talk about three main ways. The first is directly through um, donations to BEBRF. Since 1985, BEBRF has funded research totaling close to $3 million and over 70 projects. One of these projects actually led to the FDA approval of botulinum toxin for blepharospasm in the 1980s. Dr. Hallett, who's the head of our BEBRF Medical Advisory Board, wrote a really nice article in our summer 2021 newsletter, which highlighted some of the research that's been done, so I refer you to that. And on our website, you can find a complete list of all the projects we've funded over the years with researchers as far away as Germany and Italy. Our most recent funded project is headed by Dr. Silkes of San Francisco, and she is looking at whether CBD can offer additional improvement in patients who are already on stable doses of botulinum toxin. CBD is the non-psychoactive component of marijuana. So it does not cause uh, any of the psychoactive effects. There is an FDA-approved drug of CBD called Epidiolex. It's been used in childhood seizure disorder, and that's what uh, she's using in her research study. The study results are being analyzed at the present time. All the data is in, and um, it will be presented at a conference in New Orleans in November. Charlene and I hope to be there setting up an information booth and hear the presentation. What we've been told is that the results so far are very favorable. Um, no one had any adverse effects, and they had some leftover money. And so what they're trying to do with the leftover money is uh, look at patients on an even higher dose of CBD. So we're quite excited about that. The second source of funding for research on blepharospasm is the U.S. government. We are a small part of the budget of the NIH, which is the National Institutes of Health. And due to the efforts of our advocates who lobby Congress, which is known as the Dystonia Advocacy Network, DAN, you'll hear, to date, a total of $23 million has been awarded to investigators through the Department of Defense. With this funding currently, there are two projects that we're interested in. Dr. Jeffrey Kahn at Vanderbilt University is investigating a new class of anticholinergic drugs. Anticholinergic drugs include uh, drugs such as trihexafenadyl, uh, which some of you may know as Artane. Artane can be very effective in controlling dystonia symptoms, but it's not a viable treatment for most patients because of the side effects. Uh, these include memory difficulties, sedation, and even hallucinations, which can be unbearable. So these unwanted effects occur because existing anticholinergic drugs act on many receptors in the brain. And the research done by Dr. Cohen tries to target a subcategory of anticholinergic receptors so that we get the beneficial um, response with dystonia, but we don't get the undesired side effects. Also, with the Department of Defense funding, Dr. Calicos of Duke University is leading a study to see if ritonavir or other antiviral drugs which have been used to treat HIV in the past can be used in dystonia patients. In a mouse model, uh, using a unique mechanism that's different from the mechanism that slows HIV, ritonavir corrected the brain abnormalities in the striatum, which are seen in dystonia, and she hopes to pursue that research in humans. The third source of funding for research on blepharospasm is pharmaceutical companies. 
Drug manufacturers occasionally fund research they hope to promote blepharospasm treatment. One such study in the pipeline will be a joint effort with the drug company ADEX and Emory University. Dr. Jenna, um, who is on our medical advisory board, has been involved with this project. The drug name is Dipragluant, D-I-P-R-A-G-L-U-R-A-N-T. It's a brand new class of medicine. It's being investigated for the treatment of Parkinson's disease and dystonias, and the study is going to uh, commence in the next few months. If you're interested in participating, this is in the Emory University uh, area, you can contact Cameron Inju, and her email address is there. Um, and you can get it from me later if you miss that. So, yeah. so how can you help? How can you help promote uh, research on blepharospasm. Because blepharospasm is a rare condition and one that isn't fatal, it can be really challenging to get contributions from the general public. Nobody is going to care as much as we care. It's up to us to take care of ourselves and each other. So donate to the BEBRF. Donations can be unspecified, which means that your money goes for operational costs, uh, funding the salaries of our two paid employees and running our Beaumont, Texas office, uh, funding distribution of our newsletter, which comes out four times a year. Or if you desire, you can specify that your donation go solely for research. Donations can include things like bequests in your will of either money or stock. Another very important project that your donation will fund this year is a planned summit meeting of the top blepharospasm researchers in Houston in November. This type of meeting has not occurred for many years. The researchers will get together in person and discuss the current state of our understanding of blepharospasm, what future directions for research we should be pursuing, and how to broaden the community of doctors and scientists who do blepharospasm research. The second thing you can do is educate your friends and family about blepharospasm. I know it's sometimes hard to talk about our, our condition. We don't want to be the center of attention. We don't want to seem like we're complaining. But the more we educate the community around us, uh, the more um, we will get support for research from our loved ones. Consider asking them to donate in your honor for a birthday or another significant event. The third thing you can do to promote research is to participate in our yearly advocacy day. And, and on that day, we lobby Congress for government funding of research through the NIH and the Department of Defense. What this involves is sending an email or making a phone call to your specific congressional representatives, senators. You're given a scripted letter with a little section to fill out your individual story for a few paragraphs, and then you email your representatives. Um, as we said, we've been able to raise $23 million doing this. This is very important advocacy work. And the fourth thing you can do is volunteer to participate in studies yourself. We cannot do this without all of you. Thank you very much.